So this next one, this was a, a hot topic today. Maybe some of you guys saw it on Reddit. Uh, there are 27.4 empty homes for each homeless person in the U.S. Sounds efficient. That's a good free market we got there. <laughs> free to starve, free to be homeless, you're free to die with a tumor sticking out of your neck. You're you're free. You're free to be as dumb as you want to be. You're as free to be as unvaccinated as you need to be. Free to drink that yes. bird flu milk. <laughs> nice and raw. You're free to drink as much free <laughs> bird flu milk as you want. I'm telling you, man, that is stuck in my mind after this. we got to start drop shipping some raw milk, make a really nice website with AI, and just charge double. Fuck it. Like, give some kind of mission statement that really makes these guys want to pay. Just buy it from somebody else and pay. And, like, put a label them. on it, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I put that as just white paint. It's going to be white water. Uh, <laughs> my special patented at-home homemade white mystery water. <laughs> I got some. I got some water laying around. I could use, you know. Um, don't don't get me started. I would not do something nice to those people. Um, <laughs> so yeah, moving on. There there are twenty seven point four empty homes for each homeless person in the U.S. Homeless people. They're everywhere. They're stinking up the buses. They're they're stinking up the streets. They're growing out of the concrete. They need your money. They need it for various reasons, for drugs, for alcohol, for a Motel 6. Um, you ever smell, give it, took a big, good whiff of a homeless guy? Wonderful. There's, the, there's, wis, there's wisdom in there. Now, as a person that was homeless for 15 years, I am very intimate with the homeless community, the homeless lingo, the homeless way of life. I think it is paramount. I think it is above and beyond suburban life in America. You have these people living and evading capitalism and just sort of roaming town to town on the, riding freight trains, getting drunk. Very cool thing. Even if you're flying a sign and then smoking meth and being a disturbance, there's something poetic about it. For me, I just think, here's some people who decided to go a different way with it. Mm. It's the antithesis of conformity. They did something different. Now, a lot of people are hurt. They have trauma. That's why they abuse drugs. They get homeless. You get entrenched in poverty. That's the political side of it. But then there, there is a romantic side. That's why I call it the homeless romantic. There is a romantic side to it. But it's through only great strain and like real amount of suffering that you can even laugh at yourself for, for being that horrible off or whatever um, mm. but there's 650,000 homeless people in America most of them are, are in California and Florida uh, in Florida it's illegal it's highly illegal and they go to jail a lot in California it's more lax and you, you'll have the pervasive uh, tent cities that seem to be endless on under overpasses lining the Bay Area highway system. Um, they don't have any other choice, and the government's too liberal to lock them up in private prisons, which is what they would have liked to do or used to do. Um, but um, it's super sad. It's super sad that this is what capitalism does to people. So I'll read a little bit into the article, and then you can tell me what you think. I know uh, people feel uncomfortable a little bit, me talking so brazenly about homeless people. I really feel that I'm adequately uh, certified to talk about this stuff without insulting anybody, because frankly, uh, you guys probably don't know what it's like. And I could tell Before you stories you that would make, you, make your hair turn white. Yeah, before you get into the article itself, um, I think you make a good point about how people who are homeless are living outside of capitalism. They are evading it. And that's something I think about all the time, uh, going back to actually something that Zach said. Um, he was talking a lot about prefiguration, which is a concept you hear a lot about in leftist spaces, where they talk about how we can't yet envision what people who live outside of capitalism will look like because we are so stuck in it both physically and mentally. We just don't know what that would look like because all of our paradigm exists in for-profit, individualist, uh, 
constructs. So people who choose to live outside of it will look alien to us. And unfortunately, people who are living outside of it um, in a way that doesn't seem desirable to us. It's like, I think too many people in the, in the leftist spaces make the mistake of thinking that once you start existing outside of capitalism, it will immediately be so, be so desirable to the people that are having a bad time in capitalism that they will choose to do the same thing as well. When in reality, it often can look like homelessness because there are absolutely people who are homeless by choice. Um, there are the people who are doing like the tiny homes or living in vans or whatever it is that they're doing to try to evade paying rent, uh, the idea of like having to pay to exist on property. Um, and I don't know, I have like my qualms with those things because it seems like it's a, capitu a capitulation rather than like a real evasion of capitalism. But again, what are we really left to do? It's not like we can single-handedly overthrow this system. We can't even do it communally, it seems, uh, as much as we want to. But my point in bringing up Zach from Moneyless Society was because he said something about communes and how he's lived on a few different ones, met some incredible people there who are doing great work. And I'm sure that is the case, but they're obviously not doing it in such a way that it's causing people to flock to them. Um, it's like somebody like Joel Osteen could probably build a commune and attract a lot of people, but it wouldn't be something that we would want to join or recognize as anything that would be like humane or leftist. And it. it would be like some kind of for-profit Christian thing, but it's like, there, there's this element of like attracting people. And I think what people on the left are not accounting for is doing something that feels better than, privilege under capitalism and it's like your commune can be great but if it's still not as good as even like the lowest paid worker in the first world people are not going to choose to do that um i don't know it's like it's being homeless in, in the modern day is probably a lot better than being a nomad or a hunter gatherer two hundred thousand years ago but that doesn't mean that people will choose that over living in a suburban home if they think they can get that by still upholding the oppressive system that they claim they don't like you know what i mean oh absolutely absolutely and, and i think it's really just a byproduct of or it's like a consolation prize is the fact that you're skirting capitalism and you're doing and you're living outside the bounds of what you're expected to do what you what people what what the system itself sort of coerces you into this life that you need to work for money and stuff like this but yeah it was only through an immense amount of suffering that I was able to say as a consolation prize, like, well, at least I've not had a bank account for 15 years. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. cool. Um, and I, I, ma I maintained a life and, and learned and achieved things and loved and lost and, you know, had experiences and, and learned a lot. And what else is there to do in life? I, I Some people, uh, the only metric for them is property and money and power and value and, 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 and security and for me it's like knowledge and experience adventure love and stuff mm -hmm. like this and, and, that's, and that's another reason why I'm a big socialist communist kind of leaner is because this, we all have different ideas about what life is about and if we want to respect that we can't let the guys who think it's all about love and money and power kind of squash and ruin the people who just want to like paint and like <laughs> sculpt how, a vase or how do you get the whatever. Live, live types to overcome the the overly greedy types the sociopaths uh the only way through is authoritarian communism i'm, I'm sad to say actually no i'm yeah, happy to say I, I'm, <laughs> yes it's like you're we're all even and you're gonna <laughs> like it and if not the knuckle sandwiches all around we will so. educate you until you do <laughs> we're gonna educate you till it hurts you're going to be so educated, you won't be able to walk tomorrow. <laughs> um, so in the United States, a striking contrast exists between the number of vacant homes and the population uh, experiencing homelessness. So there are 27.4 uh, empty homes for each person experiencing homelessness in the country. This statistic seems, seems like it's offering a simple solution to the homelessness crisis. Uh, but there's a complex web of economic and social and logistical challenges. According to the U.S. Census, okay, there's approximately 17 million vacant houses in the nation. 17 million, okay? Simultaneously, there's around 600,000 individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So this is around 28 vacant homes per homeless person. Now, 
Detroit leads with an astonishing 116 empty homes per person. I've been to Detroit, squatter city. There's a lot of abandoned homes. You know, there's like a, a five grand home that's in rough shape in a rough neighborhood that nobody wants to live in in a burned out city and that uh, that's, could be livable, that, but nobody's living there. Um, and Syracuse, New York follows closely with 110 vacant homes per homeless person. Uh, bizarre. Bizarre shit. I don't know. That's capitalism. Um, now, the overall uh, numbers suggest an abundance of potential housing, but it is crucial to point out that uh, when you're talking about homes for rent, sale or rent, then the ratio drops a lot. So there's not a lot actually available. There's 8.6 homes per homeless person, which is still a lot. Uh, each homeless guy could have eight homes. That's a lot. Um, but it's because not every home is on the market, right? So without any homes on the market, still it's an investment that somebody's buying houses, treating it like a commodity, sitting on it, and letting the price of the property around it go up. This is what rich people are doing, you guys. Wake up. The, the, the ultra-wealthy have nothing left to spend their money on, so what they do is they go out and buy property. They went. They were so stupid. They even bought NFTs. They bought everything because they have no idea what to buy left. All they think is investment. They go, "I'll put a little here. I'll put a little there. I'll buy a little Bitcoin. I'll buy a few stocks. I'll buy some property. I'll buy a boat." They keep doing this, and whenever there's an opportunity that pops up, they jump on it. And in the case of property, they've treated it like a commodity now for since the 1980s. Where you could buy a, a house on a year's salary in 1970-ish. And now you have to take out a mortgage where you pay 30 years. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the, it letting up anytime soon. Uh, there's a lot of sadness with the commodification of housing. Okay? So... In January 2023, there were 653 Americans experienced homelessness. And keep in mind, they're not counting every homeless guy. Would you think there's people running around with clipboards looking under bridges? No, they, 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 they're unaccounted for on purpose. Homeless people don't want to be seen. They don't want to be caught. I can't tell you how many places I slept where I didn't get. Nobody knew where I was. Um, I've been woken up by the cops several times sleeping on the beach, on the sidewalk, on the in a ditch outside the Dunkin' Donuts, you name it. Uh, the 2023 figure represents the highest number of unhoused Americans in history. So we're breaking records with our homelessness now. A uh, national rate of homelessness in 2023 was appro approximately 19.4 people per 10,000. So that's a high, high number there. There are a hundred. 111,620 homeless children in the U.S. with 10,000 of them living out in outside shelters. So that's a failure of a civilization if you ask me. Over 3,000 homeless children are living on their own without guardians. Now that was my dad. My dad was one of these kids who got came from a broken home and ended up on his own in uh, uh, at 16 the, the state bought him an apartment. He had to take care of himself. Um, the number of people in families with minor children experiencing homelessness jumped 16% in 2022, growing by more than uh, 2,500, or sorry, 25,000. So 25,000 people, boom, out on the street. Um, and it's, no, and it's especially, I got, <laughs> yeah, Shout out to black people because black people experience homelessness as a rate more than four times higher than white people. 48 out of every 10,000 black people compared to 11 uh, of white people. So you, got, you guys, of course, in every scenario, get the bad end of the stick. So, so Mike, tell me what you really think, okay? <laughs> I mean, socialist countries simply don't have this problem. If you look up the home ownership rate in socialist countries, if you look up the home ownership rate even in Cuba, uh, Venezuela, countries that you think are dystopian little hellholes, shithole countries, as you might say, if you're an American, uh, they actually have a lot more home ownership and a lot less homelessness. They have a lot more employment because they have state mandated employment. It's, it's exactly what you were always taught to fear 
would happen under socialism that you're experiencing under capitalism, and that's that's indoctrination in a, in a as plain as I can make it. <clears throat> yeah, um, I I really don't understand how so many people are missing that point at the moment too. You know, like um, everybody has another different scapegoat, right? Mm. But they have all the fingers pointed every which way except the right way, which is a system thing. They want to boil it down to the most basic red team, blue team argument when they know that nuanced, look, nuanced, uh, complex answers to complex questions, they don't, they don't matter. What matters is whatever knee-jerk reaction, reactionary politics, uh, uh, locker room talk is going on. That's going to be the thing that decides which direction humanity goes, especially in a capitalist society where there's no safeguards against what kind of misinformation places like Fox News can spread. Just brainwash us to death, would you please? Um, And also it seems like the obvious solution would be some type of organization that takes advantage of these empty homes. Um, When we have this many people who are now going to experience homelessness, because it seemed to be that I remember, especially in the 90s into the 2000s, it used to be that everybody would talk about homelessness as a problem of mental illness. They would say that most people who are homeless are mentally ill and they're a byproduct of Reagan and then Bush and Clinton even having cut so many of the social programs that kept people in institutions that would have cared for them when they're unable to do so themselves. And then when they were let out onto the streets because there was no one, uh, they just stayed homeless because they cannot exist in a for-profit society. They don't have marketable skills. They can't hold down jobs, let alone pay rent or exist in a, you know, pay bills and all the things that, quote unquote, uh, mentally fit people can do. Um, but now that like yeah. m- more regular, I guess, quote people are going to experience homelessness as simply as a byproduct of proletarianization, like the fact that everything is going to keep getting more expensive, uh, climate change is only, only going to exacerbate this. Um, it seems like I'm, I'm Purple Pingers was the popular page. Uh, he's uh, on Instagram and I think he's also on Twitter but as well. But he uh, does this in, I can't remember if it's New Zealand or Australia. I'm pretty sure it's New Zealand. But he publishes addresses of empty homes. Like people will verify what is a home that is sitting empty and then he'll publish it and it goes viral and then people will just obviously try, try to go and squat in it. Um, now, of course, states are going to respond by making the squatting illegal, but it's a matter of like trying to organize in a way that you can stay one step ahead of them uh, because there are free homes to be had out there. Like That's the big message from this, right? If there's 27.4 empty homes for each person, that's a lot of free homes out there if you can find them and simply take advantage of the fact that no one is living in them. Yeah. Uh, squatter's rights, everybody. If you if you don't know, we used to squat buildings all the time. In Buffalo, I stayed at a squat that was... It was, it was great. Uh, they had taken over the place and uh, le- bought it for the legally uh, lowest amount that you could buy a house for, which was $1. Um, but there was always uh, instances where kids would take it over squats and changing the doorknobs and putting the power on and proving that they uh, were taking advantage of a house that would otherwise be abandoned or left alone. And the city, because of squatters' rights, would have to leave them alone. Now, there was a, a place in uh, either New York... Now, I had to get this story right. It's a friend of mine. Um, it was either New York or it was somewhere in Europe. But there was rules in, with the squatters when you squatted a, a building that as the cops would come and as long as you had a table and a chair and like a bucket or is that you know like or a mattress then Mm -hmm. they would make sure you had these three things and then they say okay this you're living there okay fine Um, and you would be granted squatters rights yeah Um, there was a famous squatter scene in New York and there was one called the sea squat in New York in Manhattan before everything turned very rich and ritzy my friend Chadmo was there during this time big bands came out of this this era like leftover crack or whatever weird uh, punk bands from the time and uh, they were crazy they had AK-47s and hand grenades these punks because they took over this entire uh, skyscraper like seven eight floors or something of a building was an entire uh, punk squat that was an abandoned factory of some kind that uh 
these anarchists or whatever hung out in. Mm. And uh, legally, it was contentious for a while, but they were protected for almost a decade, and then I think they got tossed out, and there was a big showdown with the police that was famous. And they sprayed them with the water cannons. Eventually, they chased everybody out, and uh, it no longer s- exists, and now there's a museum where it was. But the squatter scene is still strong. There's still people mm. out there who just take advantage. I, myself, I opened up a squat in Oakland one time uh, in California, and I came across a building that looked empty, so I, I went into it, I changed the locks. I got the power turned on in my name. I bought furniture. I filled it full. And within a week, the guy came home who owned the house. (laughs) And he said, what the hell are you doing in my house? I said, oh, well, you weren't weren't using it. it. I said, said, well, we we found it on Craigslist. And he said, all right, well, you got to get the hell out of there. He came with some of his goon friends. Like, he came with mm-hmm. some big guys. He was like, what are you guys doing? And uh, I had to put all the furniture out on the street, and I just got in my van and drove away. But the point mm-hmm. is, uh, you can fight back. I was fighting back against the housing market, which at the time I had money in my pocket, but I was still forced to live in my van because of the credit system. Uh, I had to prove that I had steady income in order to get this 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 gig even though I was making cash under the table uh, I couldn't survive in the system so I looked for shortcuts every every chance I, Mike every chance I could find I took shortcuts yeah I didn't want I didn't want to work at Pizza Hut I didn't want to I never wanted the life that I was slated for you know what I mean terrible I mean, squatting somewhere sounds Just pretty terrible. good I remember in uh, my earlier life, I used to work in construction, and the company I worked for took part in building this, uh, well, they, I got to take part in building, the company built this house um, for a wealthy businessman who worked for some kind of pharmaceutical company or insurance company, I can't remember. But it was like his shore house, um, it was right on the beach, and it was worth millions of dollars. And so they built this house, it would sit vacant for nine months out of the year, um, and probably most of the summer get used for maybe one or two weeks out of the whole year. And right next to this town, this beach town, this like very wealthy beach town, was um, some some pretty well known like slums, uh, just like impoverished areas. Um, and so someone wandered from there a couple miles down the road and ended up breaking into this house and living in it for a few months. Um, now this man was like mentally ill and didn't like take advantage of the this like extravagant house he kind of just like took a bunch of clothes out of the closet and like balled them up somewhere and like slept on those instead of like any of the 12 like really nice beds in any of the bedrooms um he just like obviously of course was like not in his right mind but like it was months before they caught this man and then they removed him um but then i also got to take part in re-renovating this house because the damage was so extensive like it was a whole new house by the end of it but it's just to say like there are a lot of free homes to be had if you can just find them and it doesn't even take a lot of even wherewithal obviously like this very mentally ill man was able to do it just by finding a dark house that was obviously not occupied in a, in a really nice town that is heavily patrolled by police it's ironic it's really weird uh, somebody in the chat says can homeless people be organized into a nationwide union or a force for revolutionary change sure but the, the problem with homeless is there like- if you, but they would be cheap. Like if you said, "Well, look, I'll give you, you know, the stuff that you need to survive." And the homeless people, they have medicines that they need to take. And when I say medicines, I mean like alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. Um, but you could, you could hypothetically get them motivated to do to do something. The thing is, they've given up on life, and so they're existing on the very most bare bones level of uh, functionality because they've been beaten down so much that they say well I'm just going to drink myself to death or whatever Um, they're sort of hopeless in a way Um, revolution starts with getting people really amped up about some kind of perceived injustice I think Uh, but yeah I'm look I'm a homeless guy I'm pretty fiery I think I could get fired up enough to crack some heads open I'd like to think um 
So, but yeah, so the homeless thing, look, the unrelenting clusterfuck that is our modern economic system, capitalism and its voracious offspring, private equity, have managed to transform the basic human need for shelter into a grotesque game of financial Russian roulette. Great game. Really great game. If someone had looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and thought, you know, it'd be fun. Let's turn that bottom layer into a fucking casino. Behold the miracle of the free market. Where housing, that trifling necessity, has been alchemized into a commodity more precious than unicorn tears and just as fucking rare. Our benevolent overlords in the private equity realm, those masters of financial magic, swoop down upon our cities like a plague of three-piece suited locusts. They snatch up every available property with the manic glee of a toddler in a toy store, armed with daddy's credit card and a raging sugar high... Ah, but surely this will lead to more efficient allocation of resources, cry the free market fundamentalists in their voice crackling of the fervor of the true believers. And indeed, it does, if by efficient allocation we mean funneling obscene profits to a handful of parasitic middlemen while rendering housing as unattainable and a coherent thought at a Trump rally. Um, Look, fear not, dear peasants, For in its infinite wisdom, our society has devised a brilliant solution to the pesky problem of homelessness. Instead of addressing the root cause, a concept which, you know, apparently is more alien than the idea of a politician with integrity, uh, we've opted for the far more pragmatic approach to building private prisons. Right. Fill them up. Fill them up to the brim. If they're poor, lock them up in solitary. Because nothing says land of the free like uh, incarcerating people for the crime of being poor. I mean, it's a stroke of genius, really. Look, to create a system that inevitably produces poverty, then criminalize poverty, and then profit off the incarceration of the poor, the circle of strife, and it moves us all straight to the fucking poorhouse or the big house, depending on how loudly you complain. Um... Uh, But yeah, so we find ourselves hurtling towards a future so dystopian it would make George Orwell piss himself in terror. Picture, if you dare, a world where 99% of the population shuffles from one form of confinement to the other. Overpriced. A glorified broom closet to actual prison cells, while the privileged 1% watch from their ivory towers, probably placing bets on which one of us will snap first. As resources dwindle and the sky darkens with the smoke of our burning hopes and dreams, we may yet discover the ultimate expression of unfettered capitalism, which is a society where the imprisoned masses, driven by desperation and a relentless logic of supply and demand, begin to view each other as not fellow victims, but as walking, talking, happy meals. In this bleak, overcast hellscape, yes, we might find ourselves nostalgic for the Halicean days uh, when the worst we had to fear was merely being priced out of our homes. Now, as we gnaw at the femurs of our former neighbors, perhaps we'll pause to appreciate the cosmic joke that is our pursuit of the American dream. We've created a nightmare where everyone's a prisoner, and the only tree, true freedom is to eat or be eaten. Um, but let's not all hope. Uh, let's not lose all hope yet, okay? Because perhaps we stand on the precipice of this cannibalistic future I'm dreaming of. Um, staring into the abyss of human depravity, we'll finally realize the madness in our current trajectory. I keep saying this because I'm a big believer that we're going to descend into cannibalism at some point. Because mm-hmm. there's all these big, delicious, juicy human beings just walking around, and and you say, crop failures and this and that and food security and I don't know what I'm going to eat and then there happens to be one thing that there's way too much of that creates... Mm -hmm. You you could either have a tasty snack or you could have a potential enemy who's vying for the same resources as you. It's much more plausible than the... uh, I mean, it's a common saying, socialism or barbarism. um, That's much more plausible, it seems, than having some kind of leftist uh, revolution that benefits people. We're much more likely to see a fascist revolution that results in cannibalism, I think. I think most people feel that. Yeah. Maybe then, with the bellies full of human meat and hearts full of empty illusions, we'll summon the collective will to imagine a different world. One where housing is a right, not a fucking commodity, 
and where the measure of a society is not the profitability of its prisons, but the well-being of its people. Until that day comes, bon appetit, you miserable bastards, and may your flesh be tender when it t comes time to feed the masses. A little salty, guys. A little salty. Sorry about that. What can I say, Mike? I'm mad. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I still am very hopeful. I still have a lot of hope for... Um, I just... Uh, it, it comes off almost like climate denialism, but I just think that it's going to take longer than we expect, and it's not going to be as drastic and sudden. And so it's going to result in certainly a lot of mass deaths, a lot of famines, and a lot of horrific conditions for a lot of people, but I just don't think it will be the end of humanity that a lot of people are thinking. And I still have a lot of hope for socialist countries, um, just not for countries that are hell-bound and determined to not care for their own citizens uh, in any way whatsoever. And I, yeah. and I think that it's, it kind of blows my mind that people are expressing so much false hope for those societies, um, fighting to keep them alive or reform them in some way, rather than admitting that they can only be overturned if we want to see any kind of progress for humanity. But, again, brainwashing goes deep. Go, go Marxist people. Go Marxist, big time. We need to we need to take a tip from the countries who are having success with providing the basic necessities for other people, and stop problems that affect the mass majority of us. What are you guys fucking stupid? <laughs> like we, I'm talking to boomers mostly, I guess. But yeah, come on, we've got to get it together you cannot have an unbalanced society it's going to go off the rails you you people think you're so patriotic but you don't give a shit about the true strength of a country which is measured by the strength of each individual person that makes up a collective 